Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast and uh, finally getting to part two of what is faith. My intention is for this to be uh, part two as well as the conclusion and uh, I need to apologize. It's been two weeks, I think at least, since I recorded and posted part one. That was not my intention. Um, Things have been very busy around here. I uh, won't go into all the details as to what and why it's taken so long. Um, I've got, let's see, at least three other recordings um, that I've done since part one posted. Um, but I didn't want to post those, of course, out of order before I got part two. Now, now the challenge is, whenever I do anything like whether it was the What is Man series or even this here, it only has two parts, of course. Um, it takes a little bit more forethought, and you know, if I'm going to be reading um, several scriptures or, or any kind of text at all, um, obviously I have to go about it a little bit different than if I'm just doing kind of random audio commentary as I drive and just kind of thinking out loud. So, uh, sorry for the delay, and uh, it's one of those things that's challenging. Um, when you give yourself to something, whether it's a topic or uh, a certain place, um, topically speaking, in in the scriptures, you know, and you kind of get in the zone of a certain thing um, that God is speaking or something that's maybe been illuminated, kind of highlighted in your life. And uh, for me, anyway, like I get in that place and it just becomes really alive. It becomes really... Um, just this vibrant topic in me. And obviously it's very easy to share out of that in the moment when that moment is present. And so here I am maybe 14, 16 days after the fact of, of the, of the, what is faith question that I was of course fully engaged in. And I've had to do a little bit of reflection. Um, and it's been really good because in the hardness of, you know, getting back into what it was that was stirring in me, you know, two, two and a half weeks ago, which of course is not long, but you know, our lives are busy and there's just a lot of things going on and we start looking into this and into that. And, you know, I've just been really reminded once more and challenged again of what I often say here in our fellowship is being careful of not being so forgetful um, of where we've been, of what we've learned, of what we've looked at, of what we've studied along the way, um, and not be so... Um, there's there's something I always say, I can't even think of it right now. Um, anyway, we have short-term memory. Maybe that's what I was trying to say. Um with scriptures and different things that the Lord might be saying. And so it's been good in that sense of kind of reflecting back. I had to, I couldn't even find my study papers um, for this specifically, and we've had to change some laptops. We had to dig out an old one because our not quite as old one uh, recently broke. And so I couldn't remember which computer it was on. And so it's been quite an ordeal. Um, and so here I am tonight, finally getting to part two. Um, and just to quickly reflect real quick, um, basically the one thing that really stood out to me, and this kind of unfolded as I was talking last time, it wasn't even in the notes that I had compiled, nor was it in um, the original time that I shared it um, on a Sunday in our fellowship here. Um, but something that really came out, because I admittedly listened to part one today while I was out driving because I needed to kind of refresh myself about what I did cover and where I left off, of course, so that I knew where to pick up again tonight. But one thing that just really struck me today that again came out as I was speaking this in part one is just the fact that everything that Jesus did in faith according to what was unseen, you know, and it, maybe I can elaborate just a little bit more even in this one. Um, and of course, if you've not listened to What is Faith Part 1, you absolutely need to go back and listen to Part 1 before you listen to this one. But presuming you have done that, it just really struck me in greater measure today as I listened on Part 1, the fact that Jesus 
his perspective was his key. Okay, it was we we've talked a lot. I personally believe that his deity was not his strongest asset, if you will. In other words, he didn't have some magic power that just enabled him to be above the natural man tendencies or above we know he wasn't above temptation. He was tempted in every way. And so what did Jesus do? He was obedient. Yes, he learned according to the things he suffered. Yes. But the thing that is really striking me today as I've been meditating on this of what I said weeks back is the fact that Jesus lived differently than any other human that had come before him because, yes, he was the seed of God. He was not the seed and offspring of man. He was free from sin. He lived perfectly obedient. Yes, these things we know are true. We could go on and on and on about the defining attributes of Jesus as he was on in the form of man on the earth. But I just really got to thinking of the on earth as it is in heaven reality. That Jesus personified the bringing into the natural what he saw in the heavenlies he saw what he what he saw the father do he implemented here what he heard the father say he spoke out of his natural mouth here in the present earth where he walked okay and so like if we can really give ourselves to that simple pattern it's not a matter of just Again, I say this so often, we're not just straining hard enough to speak truth or to have faith or to say truly the best that we can on earth as it is in heaven with almost some wishful thinking, um, very hollow hope. But instead, we're talking about what the scriptures tell us is a substance, okay? Jesus, he possessed a substance, he carried within himself something of a substance that was founded in a whole nother realm of perception, okay? I believe he could execute here on the earth what he saw, number one, because could we, could we say, because he saw it, because he heard it, okay? He saw the eternal Father doing something. He heard the eternal Yahweh God speaking something. And so can we not just kind of kind of reel things back a little bit and, and really examine that principle and think, well, maybe at least ask the question, is that the key? Is that the key? Is the key seeing and hearing according to something that is not seen here. Something that the scripture, as we talked about, and of course everyone knows this if you've been in church more than an hour, is it is the evidence, faith is, the evidence of things unseen, right? Okay, it is unseen here. It is unseen in the natural realm in which men primarily operate in, as we covered in part one. We primarily function as natural, carnal, often men, who are guided and persuaded and live according to what our natural eyes see, what our natural perception analyzes and processes, and thereby move according to what we see and what we do not. Right? Okay. So, because Jesus was perfect, because he denied himself, because he saw, because he heard, according to a different realm, a different kingdom, a different established government, a heavenly order, he therefore could walk in perfect, perfect, perfect demonstrated faith. And that my friends, is our goal. Is that not our goal that we're moving towards, as we said again, from faith to faith, that hopefully my faith today is greater in measure, if it could be put on a scale and weighed, that it is, it is more in the favor of the faith of Jesus today than it was when I recorded part one 
and when you heard part one two weeks ago, right? That is our goal. And so I left off part one with saying I was going to look at an Old Testament king, and which may seem like, okay, well, all right, this is maybe coming from nowhere. We would think, well, we're just staying Hebrews all night if we're talking about faith. But Asa was a king. He, has, he was a complex demonstration of the sides, if you will, of faith, the sides of a man of faith. He starts off strong. He starts off very impressive. The scriptures are very clear to tell us that Asa was a man who, quote, did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Okay, that is kind of the entrance into King Asa. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. That is a very commendable thing to be, to do, to be known according to, written forever in the word of God. Okay, he, his, his primary thing, as we saw in a lot of kings in the Old Testament days, but he was a great example. He came in, he saw what had happened um, with all the false gods, all the idols, and all the Asherah poles, and he tore them all down, and he burned them up, and he ground them down, and he, he cleansed everything of the false gods that had infiltrated the land. He was known for that. He came in, and he cleaned house. And one thing, of course, we know that was always prevalent in Old Testament times in the in the all of the accounts of the kings and, and the nations and the peoples and the you know the numbers of soldiers and you know obviously the Old Testament is full of a lot of imagery of battles that a lot of things of course surrounded tribes and battles and the the telling of elaborate accounts of what took place with God's people. Um, but one thing, and I'm not going to, I'm not just going to read the scriptures because he's in several places in the Old Testament, um, primarily in second Chronicles, uh, 16. Um, but I'm just going to touch on some of these things because one thing that Asa was known for is he would go into battle completely set that his God alone would be his strength and his ability like he was known for just really having a faith of expectancy that his god was capable of caring for his people it was not his own strength it wasn't his own military prowess it wasn't the the um it wasn't the strength of his army you know it was it wasn't rooted in natural circumstances one thing that i came across in this study i do remember is um his father kind of laid a similar pattern. You can see him in the scriptures as well, um, not looking according to natural circumstances. Their armies, his both his father's and his, were very often outnumbered numerically. I mean, they were like drastically outnumbered and in the natural were absolutely set up for defeat. But Asa was always clear. Um, if I can find some of these quickly. Um, in the scriptures here in Second Chronicles, Asa called to the Lord. This is um, Second Chronicles fourteen eleven. Okay, so there there's battle formations. There's these men coming up against them, and Asa calls out to the Lord, his God, and he says, "Lord, there is no one beside you to help in the battle between the powerful and those who have no strength. So help us, O Lord our God, for we trust in you." And in your name have come against this multitude. O Lord, you are God. Let not man prevail against you. And this may sound very simple. And, you know, in a sense it is. I mean, but the thing that really strikes me is, is Asa's association that, that the battle really is the Lord's battle. That he's not talking about conquering great great peoples and great nations according to his name, according to his kingdom, according to his exaltation, he is saying, even at the end of that verse, let no man prevail against you, God. And and so there's some appropriation that Asa was doing at that time of the battle was about the Lord and his people. It wasn't about all right, God, we believe these guys are the enemies. They are mean to us. We don't like them. 
Um, therefore, we don't think you do either. So come and slay your enemies and allow us to slay your enemies on your behalf. It was, it was really some sort of understanding that this battle was the Lord's battle and the enemies were the Lord's enemies. Okay, it wasn't some personal vendetta that Asa had to just wage war upon nations in the name of God to be a victorious king. He had something that he understood that the battles were the Lord's. His life goes on, it's very encouraging at the beginning and a very strong warning at the end, which is what I want to get to here in a minute. Um... I want to I want to really draw this out here. Okay, so this scripture most people would know it. Um, it's a scripture that I've actually been looking at since this in a very unconnected way. I mean, it's very interesting how I've landed there. Um, it's a very cool scripture. Okay, so we know this verse. We've heard it quoted. Um, who knows what context? I mean, all kinds of feel good things. But for the eyes of the Lord. The eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he, the Lord, may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. Okay, we've heard that verse more than likely if you've been in Christian circles for very long at all. Again, this is another one that you know rings a bell, if you will. Um, the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, so that he may strongly support those whose heart is is completely his. Okay, well, that's very interesting. That's very encouraging. I, I, there's a lot, excuse me, there's a lot within that that is kind of flowing over into other areas of things I'm looking at and thinking about. Um, and so what stood out to me, though, is, is the context that that was in, and that, that kind of gets to our warning part. I don't want to fast forward too much, but my point is not within that specific part of the text right now. But what I do want to point out and highlight is that whose heart is completely his is a perfect heart. Okay, so this sounds like an interesting challenge, right? The word perfect, oh my gosh, it's completely his. What in the world is our hope to be found as those men with a perfect heart, a heart that is perfectly towards God, right? But this word is directly related to shalom, and of course we know shalom means peace. Another version states that this is the man whose heart is perfect towards God. It may seem unattainable to most of us. Well, it's not. It was understood to mean that the Lord will strongly support the man who is whole, full, and at peace, dwelling in safety. That's kind of like the expanded version, if you did a word study on that and you started kind of pulling the deeper meanings behind that. I'm going to read it again. Um, It was understood to mean that the Lord will strongly support the man who is whole, full, and at peace and safety in God. Like his entire being is devoted to believing in faith that God is fully capable. He's fully capable of holding me, preserving me, delivering me. Everything that happens in my life is at his hand. It is from his mouth, completely held within his strong hand, right? This man at the, in the shalom, in the peace, in the resting, in complete faith towards God. An unshakable man who knows his God and is stable in all of his ways. And this is how Asa was known. He was known to be that man. He wasn't worked up. He wasn't stirred up. He's not talking about being anxious when the battles come and, oh God, are you sure? I mean, are you sure you can do this? You know, we don't see that pattern in his life, in the beginning stages of his life. And and I I don't have it in front of me right now. I want to believe he ruled as king for 40 years. Um, I don't have time to even go through that. I don't like flipping a bunch of pages while I'm trying to record something. You have a Bible, more than likely. You can take the time to read this account in Second Chronicles 14, 15, 16. 
um, for yourself. It's very encouraging to to read these things. Okay, so what's happening when we hear this verse? For the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that He may strongly support those whose heart is completely His. Okay, so that would be encouraging. That's good to know. Okay. But the verse goes on to finish saying, and then I'll give you the context, right? You, however, Asa, have acted foolishly in this, and we'll talk about what this is. Indeed, from now on, you will surely have wars. And I don't want to skip this part, because back in chapter 15 of Second Chronicles, a prophet comes, he is sent to Asa to give him a warning. The Spirit of God comes on Azariah, the son of Oded, and he went out to meet Asa, and he said, Listen to me, Asa, and also to Judah and to Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him. And if you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Okay? So the... Well, you talk about a prophetic warning, you better pay attention to that one, right? Let's just read it again. I love the wording of it. I, can we say this is applicable to us as well? The Lord is with you when you're with him. If you seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Okay, so it goes on and continues in verse 4. In their distress, they turned to the Lord God of Israel, and they sought him. And he, God, let them find him. Okay? But there's no peace in the land. There's a bunch of trouble. The nations are, are crushing nations. There's great distress. Goes on in verse 7. But you, Asa, Benjamin, Judah, be strong and do not lose courage. Don't let your hands drop. Don't, don't let yourself just kind of lay low and like, chill and be casual and like okay but there is reward there is reward for your work okay so it goes on and continues i'm just going to kind of breeze through some things verse 8 in summary asa hears the words of the prophecy of azariah the son of oded he took courage and he removed the abominable idols from all of the land of Judah and Benjamin and from the cities which he captured in the hill country, Ephraim. He restored the altar of the Lord, which was in front of the porch of the Lord. All right, he goes on and on. He does all these things. Again, he is the man who what? Who was found to be pleasing in the sight of the Lord. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. How great to be called that man. Yes? (laughs) Yes? <laughs> okay. Um, so it goes on. Asa goes to war. He goes to battle. All these different things. Um, here we are now in chapter 16 of Second Chronicles, the 36th year of Asa's reign. Uh, Basha, king of Israel, comes up against Judah. Now this gets kind of complicated. It would take more time than I'm really willing to spend tonight. It's very late. You can look into these things. Do we read the scriptures? Do we study to show ourselves approved? I hope so. Um, But somebody comes in, they set themselves and camp themselves around the kingdom um, where Asa rules, and and people cannot come and go. He gets frustrated, all these different things. He, of course, says, I have to take care of this. This is a problem. But what he does is he goes to another man. He goes to a man for help, for advice, for military prowess. Instead of going to the Lord, he goes to a man. Very, very interesting and pivotal, it would prove to be, change in Asa's approach. We're not told why. We're not told what happens. We're not told why in the world all of a sudden he takes matters into his own hands. But we are shown clearly that he in fact does. Okay. So, this is when uh, another prophet is sent. Um, Let me see if I can find it. Hanani, who knows? (laughs) Uh, The seer came to Asa, king of Judah, and said to him, this is another warning, it's just like the previous one, where Azariah comes, he warns Asa, if you turn away, you know, if the Lord will turn away, and if you draw, I mean, all these things, and Asa responds rightly in humility and says, 
yes, and then continues to be that man who is right inside the Lord, but something's changed. And so this seer comes to Asa. He gives him warnings. He said, because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. He's reminding Asa of what he had done, what had happened, what had been the fruit of his faith that was established in the God of the people, and his faith and expectancy in something that was not seen. He was not, Asa, was not worried about him always being outnumbered, how they were sometimes outnumbered by tens of hundreds of thousands of soldiers, but he was not shaken. He was a man of faith and of expectation. He knew his God. He knew the capability of God and stood in that, in strength, in peace, in perfect heart, right? But something's changed. But this seer is reminding Asa of what happened when he relied on the Lord, And this is when that verse comes in, the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth so that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. In other words, that was you, Asa. You were a demonstration of that truth. God showed himself strong on your behalf because you fully relied upon him in faith. But you have acted foolishly in this. You have not stood in faith and expectancy that your God can handle this. You have yourself gone about it your own way and your own wisdom and your own understanding and looking with your own natural eyes at a circumstance that you decided for whatever reason you would take matters into your own hands and handle. And so indeed, this goes on to say, from now on, you will surely have wars. All right, so this seer gives a prophecy to Asa that is very unfavorable, and all of a sudden, something excuse me, has changed. And so what does Asa do? Repent, turn? No. This is when everything, which is so astounding to me, begins to fall apart about this man who was right in the sight of the Lord. Asa, in um, 1610, was angry. He was angry with the seer, and he put him in prison. For he was enraged at him for this. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. So all of a sudden, this man, who we're told for for nearly 40 years, rules and reigns a kingdom of tearing down everything that opposes God and building up the faith of an expectancy that has nothing to do with natural circumstances. All of a sudden, he's enraged. He throws the prophet seer of God into prison, and he even punishes his own people out of his anger, oppresses them. Okay? It's, 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 it's really fascinating. And in the 39th year of his reign, Asa became diseased in his feet. His disease was severe, yet even in his disease he did not seek the Lord, but the physician's. So Asa slept with his fathers, having died in the 41st year of his reign. And it goes on in verse 14, and this is what ends the life of Asa, the awesome king who did what was right in the sight of the Lord. He is buried in a tomb that he carved out with his very own hands. Amazing. Absolutely incredible that this would happen to this man. The pattern of Asa continued to go forth as a demonstration of the awesome faith in the eternal Yahweh God. And in an instant, he makes a decision that is outside of faith in God and puts faith in his own abilities, his own ideas. And it's his demise. It's his end. Literally, we're told, he gets sick. Even in that, he does not go to God for any help, for any assistance, for any miraculous relief or healing. Why are we told that he only goes to physicians? Why are we told that? Other Other than to make it clear for us to glean from this, as we glean from the Hebrews of 11, men of faith, we can look at 
King Asa, who was the man that was right in the sight of the Lord, but may we be warned of how important our decisions are as men who desire to live by faith. Can we say, now listen, ask your heart, ask your mind right now what you're feeling. Because I've got to believe there are some people out there like, oh, Joel, come on now. Are you saying that like if I'm a man of faith for 40 years and all of a sudden I make one decision that is rooted in my own strength and my own ability, I'm going to get diseased and die alone? I'm not saying that, but I'm saying, can we be so sober and serious and focused and devoted to adding to our faith upon faith upon faith and being found as men of faith in all the things that we read in in part one, walk by faith and not by sight. The righteous man will live by faith. We have been justified by faith through Jesus Christ. Are we doing everything that soberly because we see these men for what purpose? Why am I told about King Asa? Why is he in the eternal word of God for me to read today? Except other than, as we say with so many other um, people in the Bible that we read about that are not just fictional characters, but are people for us to learn from, there is a purpose for us to know these things about this seemingly random King Asa. Because it's almost unbelievable that he would end in such a way. And this must be a warning to us. And so our goal is not only to start strong and presume we'll be good. I exercised faith once in 1978. Okay? I I walked in a level of faith that was really awesome. I was a believer and I had great expectations, but you know those things didn't pan out, so I know God's good. It's all for a purpose, right? He works all things together for good for those who I I know that, right? But do we do we have more than that? Do we have more than just slogans and even verses that kind of make us feel better even though in our hearts uh, in our innermost place, we don't really have a faith and belief that God is who he says he is. And it's surely not the faith of Jesus Christ, that perfect faith that was, again, established and dwelling in and coming out and down from the heavenly place perspective, hearing what the Father speaks and doing what I see him see. What I see him do. Do we live in that type of life? Because again, let it be a reminder to us yet again, our goal, our like our ultimate task is to be as Christ, is to live as he did on earth as it is in heaven. Why did he tell us to pray that? And why did the men's at why did the men ask Jesus? teach us how to pray, or tell him, you know, and it's a question, would you teach us how to pray? Oh, please teach us. How do you, in other words, how in the world do you pray like that? Jesus was a man of perfect faith. Perfect. He lived according to faith. So we must not just start strong, but build that faith upon faith. From faith to faith must be our life. Our heart must be completely His. We must examine ourselves. We must be still and know that He is God. No wavering, no wondering. Okay, well, this went really bad for me. God, are you there? That is not the pattern we see of those who have gone before us and went to the end in being full men of faith. I mean, I'll just touch on it again, like we've been reading Acts here in our house, and Stephen, you know, we're, we just can't get past that. He was what? He was full of grace. He was full of the Spirit. He was full of faith. He was overflowing. He was filled to the fullest of these attributes. And those weren't just, you know, they're not just um, like 
personality traits. There's something of substance that these men possess, that Jesus possessed to the full. And the last thing I want to share, and this is going to be my closing, I can't leave you hanging because if you listen to part one, um, <laughs> I said, I'm just going to drive a point home with my conclusion that's just going to, you know, whatever I said. I was all excited. And it hasn't lost its its substance, but, you know, I'm probably not going to deliver it here in the same. It's 1030 at night, and, and I'm just, you know, getting to the end of this, and I'm surely not saying, well, I just need to get it done. But may this just stand on its own without me trying to elaborate its awesomeness, right? One thing that, that I shared in part one and probably previous, and this sounds like a redundant thing, but a brother was sharing about Hebrews 11, you know, it's been several weeks ago now, and he wasn't talking about this, but as I've just been meditating on it, um, about Sarah, and in Hebrews eleven eleven, by faith, even Sarah herself received ability to conceive, okay? Even beyond the proper time of life, she was way too old. She, though, however, she, Sarah, considered God faithful who had promised. Okay, so God promised something to Sarah. Seemed outlandish, seemed, not just seemed, it was literally impossible at her age. It's like biologically impossible, okay? But by faith, she received the ability to conceive. And there is just something, and see, as I say that, I'm like, I'm right back where I was two or three weeks ago with that. Does this not show us that faith is literally creative by nature? Does it not show us that somehow, somehow can we dare to believe that faith, a true faith that originates in God, somehow possesses a seed of something that can even meet things here in the natural? Now, I don't even, maybe I just need to clarify that what this isn't. This isn't some doctrine of like, believe whatever, whatever you can imagine. Right now I'm imagining a yacht out on the ocean and, and I'm walking along it, holding my Bible and drinking, you know, mimosas and, you know, this is not that. And if anybody thinks it's that, then I've not made anything clear throughout any of these podcast episodes. But what I'm saying is, can we believe scripturally by this verse and many others that, again, this one says, clearly, by faith, Sarah herself received ability to conceive. Okay? That's ridiculous. She received the power... For the laying down of seed, that do its dunamis power, she receives something supernatural, something has nothing to do with natural circumstances. Somehow, because she was in faith, she received that power to even become impregnated to carry a physical, natural child. And we know what happened out of that. But can we not take that principle, and is it too much to stretch and to say that in that reality, may that be true in our lives? What if we became true men of faith, which would make me a righteous man, which would allow me to walk by faith and not according to what my natural eyes see? We are so limited. We are so bound to our natural man functions. We have got to get above that. We've got to learn to operate as Jesus did. And because he indwells those who have been regenerated and been given a heart of flesh, where he can now dwell and the temple of God is moved from without to within me, and you, should that be you, that same ability now resides in you and I to actually be a man in flesh and bone bodies that can do that. We can do it. 
So the question isn't, is it possible? Is it real? Can we? But will we? Will we do it? Will we give ourselves to believe in such a manner that when we look upon any circumstance that seems impossible, whether we're talking about dying to our flesh or loving our enemies or any other thing we could name that we say is impossible, that is like we have an army of a hundred and they have an army of a million. Those types of odds. May those things become irrelevant because our eyes are not on those things. They're not set upon the natural limitations of natural kingdoms. Because as Jesus lived, he said, on earth as it is in heaven. That was already true for him. That's why he could do what he did. And that's why those who are the Christ men regenerated and now in his lineage and likeness and image can do likewise. That is faith. That is the answer to what is faith. It is a man who does what is right in the sight of the Lord in an expectancy and an assurance and a confidence that God is way more capable of anything that seems overwhelming to me, impossible to me, that I have been given a seed that empowers me by faith to conceive something, for something to become alive in me that should not and cannot in any other way by faith. So may we, those called according to his name, may the church that is on this earth become a people of faith again. Where in the world is faith when God's eyes look and they do roam to and fro and they're looking? Who who, who will he find? Will I find any faith on the earth? As in the days of Noah, right? Right? When he asks that question, may he find more than one man? May he find more than one family? May he find a corporate family? May he find his body? May he find his church? May he find his people in a unified corporate way, endeavoring to be a men, a a, 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 a nation, an actual nation of faith? Declaring to the heavenlies the glory of God in men. So what is faith? I would like to say that this is faith. This is faith. Read your scriptures, people. I need to read them more. I'm not saying that in a scolding way. I can look in the mirror and say, read it, Joel. Study it more, Joel. May that be so for us. May we get a foundation as we looked at in that first, in the part one. Like, how do we, how does faith come? By hearing. What are we hearing? I mean, literally, what are we hearing? And how much of what we're hearing has zero capabilities of giving us any faith? If faith is lacking, we're not hearing. So may we even start there. May we start in the right manner. May we start in the right order and be a people who are giving ourselves to ears that are tuned to the eternal word of God. Because he is speaking. We're just not listening. So may we be men of faith. May we raise our expectations. May we begin to Just somehow train ourselves to think according to things that are not yet seen. And believe that there's a substance within that for us to attain and hold on to and possess as something that is a seed that can be creative and and conceive something within me that I cannot and will not any other way. Amen.